Welcome everyone to this session in which we'll be talking about how to turn net zero from ambition into action. Very pleased to be joined by Mauricio Ramos, the CEO of Millicom. And I'm actually a former customer of yours, Mauricio, during my time in Nicaragua. I was doing research for a book last year um, and I spent a couple of weeks on the beach in Popoyo and I got a Tigo SIM card, which worked very well, even right out there on the beach. No problems at all. Um, so Nicaragua is, of course, one of several Central and South American countries where you have been rolling out your services. And when you announced the expansion of your services in Central America, I think it was just earlier this year, my colleague Michael wrote about your investments in the unloved region of Central America. I'm not sure what you think about that, but more broadly, if we talk about the net zero challenge, um, clearly, as we were saying earlier today, developing countries have to be front and center of that conversation, including developing countries in Latin America. What is the net zero transition going to look like in these countries? I think these countries are going to play an integral part in that transition. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why I utterly believe that's going to be the case. And actually, one of the reasons we've made such a big, big commitment to this region. This is a region that is the youngest in the world. Central America in particular, but Latin America is the, the, one of the youngest populations in the world. On all of these youngsters, they were just born with a mindset of net zero. It's unspeakable to them that we, as business, as politicians, as directors, would be considering anything other but a net zero world for them. So this is, a, this is a, an area of the world that is young, digital, and as a result of that will be, is already embracing net zero. No doubt whatsoever. But if we look at the, the wider conversation, we look at the support that developed countries have promised to developing countries in Latin America and elsewhere, it hasn't really been sufficiently forthcoming. So do you think these countries are in a position to really drive forward the change that they need to see? Or, or really are developed countries, including Canada, including the UK, going to have to do much more to, to support them in that transition? Everyone has to do a little bit, but I'll give you two or three things that make me very, very positive. And, and, and as many of you who, who may know me and what we're doing, we're just real optimists in the region. Um, to give you an idea, of the last three to four years, we've invested $5 billion of new money, M&A kind of money, into Central America. Nicaragua, where we bought an asset. Panama, where we've made a $2 billion commitment and Nicaragua, in which we've made a $2 billion commitment. New money, M&A money, that has gone into these countries. Um, for those of you in the audience who may not be as familiar uh, with what we do, we're basically a broadband provider. We do fixed connectivity, broadband connectivity, to residential homes and to businesses. And we do mobile to about 50 million users in the region. For those of you who are Canadians, we're like a Rogers, if you will, providing service to businesses. There you go. <laughs> I'm glad I made the connection. So we do residential broadband, we do mobile broadband. We just do it in nine countries in Latin America. And we're very committed to the region um, because the region has a young population, digital embracing population, significant amounts of underpenetration in broadband. Whereas in Canada, just about everyone has a mobile phone with a data connection, 100% plus penetration. In our markets, 50 to 60%, Simon, on fixed residential broadband, where just about everyone here probably has a good cable or fiber connection. In our markets, that's going to be 40 to 50%. So half of the homes still need a broadband connection. And businesses are also looking for more and more connectivity. So the point I'm making is, and, and, and I say this all the time, digital gets you to be closer to net zero. Why? There's been a lot of reports out there 
that correlate the embracement of ICT, digital technologies, with a reduction in greenhouse emissions. About the, the, the use of ICT technologies across sectors in an economy has been determined to generate somewhere between 15 to 25 percent reduction in other sectors of their GHG emissions. This is a region, Latin America, Central America, in which the more ICT technologies are adopted, the more broadband connectivity is adopted, the more it will move towards net zero. Now, the commitment from some of the leaders in the region, going to your point, is nothing short of strong. Most of the countries we operate in, the percentage of the energy that today is produced with hydro or, or clean or renewable energies is somewhere in the two-thirds. So it's already high enough. But most countries have made a commitment to make it be 80% and to have 12 to 15% of their um, energy be renewable in the next five years. So there is a lot of commitment from these countries to bring in net zero, into their philosophy and at the same time to use more broadband ICTs to get there. Hope I've answered your question. Absolutely. Why we're believers. And for, and, and for you at a corporate level, um, what are your ambitions beyond the, the effects that your services can help to help, can have to help others meet their targets? What are your targets as a company to try to improve your own environmental footprint? So the first thing we did um, when I started as a CEO some six or seven years ago was to set out a very clear purpose for the organization. Without purpose, you're just basically trying to find what your identity is. And in today's world, governments, we're a highly regulated company, workers and investors want to know what you stand for. And we basically said we build digital highways that connect people, develop our communities, and improve lives. And we use the word digital highway for two reasons. One, we wanted to create the notion that everything that the new economy does, the economy of the 21st century, the digital economy, the fourth industrial revolution, is really move bits around. That's really what it does. If you have a if you have a jeans factory, you're buying cotton and you're moving cotton around. If you're in ICT, what you're doing by building these networks is you're moving bits around, video, voice, whatever. But we wanted to create the notion that the economies need digital highways as much as they need physical highways. And to land that notion with regulators, with presidents, with governments, that this is digital infrastructure that gets used by all the other sectors of the economy. And hence the notion that the more ICT you use, the more the other sectors will be able to bring down their GHG emissions. Interestingly, telecom operators, ICT operators themselves, like ours, are low contributors to GHG. 2 to 4% has been measured. But the impact that we can have in the reduction of GHG in other sectors is many times more that, hence the relevant of what we call this digital highways. So our goal is to bring digital highways, infrastructure development, to all the economies we operate in, to make sure that the Central Americans, the Latinos, have the ability to bring their talent compete with everywhere else in the world. And this is how we get the attention by putting out this purpose of regulators, green investors, and infrastructure investors, which we aim to bring to help finance this digital revolution that we're trying to bring about into our economies. It's an interesting emphasis that you have on the impact of what a company does with its business versus its own particular carbon footprint. And it makes me think of an argument that seems to be hotting up. And it was 
put perhaps most prominently by, by a French NGO saying that it's actually not helpful in the opinion of this NGO for companies to have net zero targets. They're saying net zero is a global thing. We need to be shooting for net zero as a human civilization. But if we just simply have every company aiming for net zero, actually, that's not the answer. You need to have some, some companies going further. Some companies might not be able to get there. And what's really important is how a company feeds into that broader picture. So what's your approach to that? And, and does Millicom have a net yeah. zero target? How are you trying to get towards it, if so? And what's the importance of having a net zero target for a company? So this is, this is the thing about businesses and, and hopefully well-run businesses, you got to give your team a goal. If you don't have a goal, the teams are just running around shooting the ball, passing the ball. What they want to do is they want to score and they want to know how they're measured. So yes, you must absolutely have a goal. That's how you measure success. That's how you know where you're going to. So just um, last year, uh, we put actually earlier this year, we put out publicly during our investor day with all our investors and, and our investors are really from around the world. We made a commitment um, to be net zero by 2050. And we publicly said that we would be submitting our methodology process goals to the science-based initiative, which we have. And although I can't really say very much about it, we know that we're being reviewed. And we are excited to, um, to get their formal approval for our goals uh, because goals are super, super important. That's how you align a company. You have to tell them where we're going for. And I am, I'm, I'm excited about the notion that we have made an external commitment because then internally the team is all emboldened to get to those goals they understand them they see the logic and then the technology teams the commercial teams the service looking teams are saying well how can i contribute and then you get a fairly large organization all saying okay how can i help how can i do it and then you get your own board saying well wait a minute you just made a commitment so now we got to really make sure this is formally measured. So in a journey that we started six years ago, that has led today, well, this year, to external commitments, we're at a point where we're no longer saying, OK, oh, this is aspirational. Let's go plant some trees. We're saying, no, science-based. We really need to work to get into energy efficiency and energy renewals. Everyone in the organization has to come up with a plan country by country, function by function, and the chair of our audit committee is basically saying, wait a minute, this has to be really audited. So we're at a point in time today in which our audit committee is requesting our CFO to really embed our goals into our fp &A processes, which really tells you, and this is just a long way of saying, this is what a goal does for a company, and then you can add them all up for the world, it gets everybody aligned, it gets into real measurements, and it gets into getting your team emboldened. And when it comes to that measurement and tracking, do you feel that you already have the tools that you're gonna to need to do that? Or realistically, are those tools still being developed? They're not quite ready yet. Since we've made external promises, since my audit committee is really holding me accountable for it, I think we're at the level of maturity where we can make these external commitments. We can subject ourselves to external disclosure measurements. We, we do a ton of reports, GRI, CDP, MSCI. So I think we're at a point in time in which our finance organization, our FNPNA organization, can measure everything we do and I can be certain that what we're saying is correct. But one of the really important issues when it comes to net zero is offsets, right. um, because that's realistically for many companies, that's gonna be one side of the ledger. On, yeah. on one side of the net zero ledger, you have reduction of emissions, but as long as there is any residual emissions there, you're gonna to have to have 
carbon dioxide removal or some form of offsets um, to deal with that. And there's a lot of concern about the state of the offset market at the moment. Mm -hmm. There are various academics who are pointing out what seem to be quite serious problems to do with the reliability of, of certain projects in the space. And yet, to some extent, according to the IPCC and others, we're going to have to have carbon dioxide removal in the mix. What's your approach to this, this question and to offsets um, in particular as a company? So, like many others, we've, we've embraced as, as one of our ways of approaching the issue, energy efficiency and energy renewals, or you know, the adoption of renewal. <clears throat> we're doing a lot on efficiency, but we realize that that's not enough, but that's a lot of we can do what we can do internally. And, and we can talk about that later. Uh, our goal when energy efficiency is to put, like, just, just, uh, just to give you an idea on efficiency first, what we put out, what we produce, goes up about 30% a year, bits. So we, we produced 30% more bits, our networks, so that our consumers could use it on a yearly basis. We measure our energy consumption and it needs to grow far less than that. That's how we get energy efficiency measured at the most basic level into what we do. So last year, 2021, we produced 26% more bits. Data consumption went up 26% across our nine countries, but our energy consumption went out only 9%. So we know that we're being efficient in the use of our energy. Renewals is actually a lot harder, our energy renewals, because most of the markets in which we operate, indeed, there's very little we can do. And that's your point, I believe. So we're only beginning to do work on that. For example, in um, Colombia, we've signed energy purchase agreements because there is a market there that allow us then to give and this is about 7% of our energy consumption, 4,500 megawatts hour uh, to new renewal, uh, clean energy renewals. But that just gives you an idea of how hard it is. Only 7%, and we just started a year ago. But in other countries, and I, our, our friends from Panama, uh, in which there's more developed markets, we are actually going to direct sources and generating the agreements directly with them so we can facilitate those uh, renewals. And that's getting to be about 10%. But that, those numbers give you an idea of how difficult it is to have, find markets to buy renewable energy from. We think if companies like ours, and we are probably one of the largest corporations in all the markets we operate in. If we start actively saying in those markets, Honduras, El Salvador, even Nicaragua, by the way, that we are either buyers of certificates or enablers of new projects for um, this uh, production of clean energy, then the market will start getting some traction. And that's what we're doing to get into that. And just to finalize the, what we're doing in, in those areas, in Colombia, a lot of our new sites, think sites, mobile sites, that have to be powered with energy, all the new builds, about 70% of the new builds, are actually solar powered. So we're generating the ability to have those of a grid that may not be completely renewable by making them a renewal source. Uh, those are the new sites. What do we do with the old sites? Good question. On that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there as we're sadly out of time. But thank you, Mauricio, for a really okay. fascinating conversation. So much more to discuss. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to think back to my happy days on the beach in Nicaragua. <laughs> so thank you again, Mauricio. And thank you, everyone, right. for listening. Very good. Thank you so much.